Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining our webinar today. The webinar is entitled The ExoDX Prostate Test for Risk Assessment of High-Grade Prostate Cancer. This is Carla Gagne with Exosome Diagnostics, and we're so glad that you can join us, and we do hope that all of those that you care about are staying safe. I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. All listeners are in uh, listen-only mode for the duration of the event. There will be opportunities for questions at the end of the program by entering them in either the chat box or the question box at the bottom right hand of the screen. If we cannot get to your question on the program, we will follow up via email. This event will be recorded and a link will be available on our website at www.exosomedx.com. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. David Albala. Dr. Albala is Chief of Urology at Krauss Hospital in Syracuse, New York and with the Associated Medical Professional Urology Group. He's considered a national and international authority in laparoscopic and robotic urological surgery and has been an active teacher in this area for over 20 years. His research and clinical interests have focused on robotic urological surgery and he's been a visiting professor at numerous institutions across the United States and all over the world. With that introduction, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. David Albala. Thank you. Well, thanks, Carla, and uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here today. I hope what we can do in the next 45 minutes is talk about the ExoDX test, which is a, a risk assessment tool using urine to assess high-grade prostate cancer. And what I hope to do is, is show you the data in the validation study, talk about uh, the types of patients that it's used for, for example, men that are greater than 50 years of age that have a, um, you know, a PSA between two and 10, sort of that gray zone, and how this test can help you in making clinical decisions for biopsy, not only initial biopsies, but, but repeat biopsies. So here's the, the agenda that I put together for us today. We're gonna kind of look and discuss the clinical need. Then we're gonna give a brief description of, of what exosomes are and how the ExoDX test really works to give us a risk assessment tool. We'll then go through the validation studies, the clinical utility studies, and, and talk about those in detail, then some milestones, and then uh, we'll discuss a, a clinical case with three patients that have the same age, the same PSA, and show how this test can really separate those patients that we may want to consider uh, doing a, a biopsy on. So I think when we talk about uh, the need uh, in uh, a clinical need of prostate biopsies, I know many of us are doing biopsies in our practice. We do about 2,500 biopsies a year. Um, many of those biopsies, up towards of 75%, typically are either benign or, or negative for malignancy or have low grade disease, such as uh, Gleason 3 plus 3. And there are uh, complications that I think we all know that can occur from biopsies. Hematospermia uh, tends to occur commonly in many of these patients. They can have pain and fever, uh, hospitalization due to you know, infection, and you can see the infection rates are, are still about 1.5%. There can be some dis, uh, sexual dysfunction and incontinence, but the bottom line is, is you know, we're trying to identify the aggressive cancers and the less aggressive cancers, such as the Gleason 3 plus 3s, we want to try to avoid overtreatment in these individual patients. So we're going to present three patients today. Here you can see three patients, essentially equal age and equal PSAs. And the question is, if these patients came into your office, you know, would you recommend that a biopsy be done or not be done? And what I hope to do is go through the, the data with you, and then we'll come back and look at these patients and, and see which ones uh, should have been biopsied and which ones could have avoided a biopsy had we done the XODX uh, prostate test. So really, we don't really have a mechanism to differentiate which of these patients will need a biopsy due to high-grade prostate cancer. And that's what we hope to find out. So we're going to talk about what exosomes are, and exosomes are membrane-bound extracellular vesicles that are produced in the endosomal compartment of most eukaryote or prokaryote cells. 
they were discovered in about uh, around 1983 in immature red blood cells. And we've used these to try to uh, give us information about actually normal states as well as disease states. Uh, I think when you look at this slide, you get to see that exosomes are incredibly small. They range on the, the size between 300 and 100 nanometers, very similar to what we see with viruses. As all of us know, viruses are in the news today every single day. But it gives you a sense of when we look at bacteria, platelets, and the cells, when you look at the cell, you know, most cells are 8 to 12 uh, micrometers, which is a millionth of a meter. So these are extremely, extremely small uh, 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 membrane vesicles that, that really have a lot of information for us. As we, we talked about earlier, they're produced by the eukaryote or prokaryote cells, and they do play a role in health and disease. They contain a lot of information of RNA, DNA, and different proteins. And this information in both the normal state as well as the disease state can give us a lot of information of what, you know, the types of cancer, if they're aggressive, and if these patients should perhaps undergo a biopsy. And in some ways, we can think of exosomes as sort of the Twitter messages that play a role in intracellular communication. They do contain the RNA, DNA, and protein, and these markers really can be identified and it can be collected in any biofluid that exists. So they do play a role in cellular communication, the immune system, and they do stimulate uh, tumor growth. And they're released by the thousands. And that's where the beauty of this is, is that we can, you know, essentially gain this information and then use it to make useful clinical decisions going forward. Now, to put this in perspective, you know, I think that if you look at the publications that have occurred with DNA sequencing, you can see that back in the 1980s, 90s, you started to see this trend of increasing publications occurring in DNA se sequencing. This is now tapered off, and we're starting to see the same type of trend, this increasing trend, exist with exosome publications. So not only in prostate cancer, but as you will see as we start to, to understand more, this will have some value perhaps in bladder cancer and, and uh, uh, kidney cancer going forward. Using these fluids, we can try to extract information that will be useful for us to try to gain knowledge on on the different disease states. What's nice about exosomes is they allow detection of disease and we can follow this with sort of longitudinal tracking. It does provide real-time data. And most importantly, exosomes, when we look at with prostate cancer, it does overcome the tissue heterogeneity concern. And we'll see that exosomes really are a genomic marker for aggressive prostate cancer on biofluids. They differ from uh, other biomarkers, the 4K and the, and the Phi. These are non-genomic biomarkers. These are markers that use PSA or subtypes or, or uh, isoenzymes of PSA to essentially extract knowledge from. But the true genomic marker, an exosome, uh, is a true genomic marker that allows us to essentially predict or risk stratify patients that will be helpful for biopsies. It's a three gene a biomarker that exists. And as you can see, you know, uh, it looks at uh, the three gene, the three biomarkers are PCA3, ERG, and SPDEF. So this slide is extremely important because this test has to be utilized in men that are greater than 50 years of age that have a PSA in that gray zone from two to 10. And essentially what this test does is assess the risk for high-grade prostate cancer, Gleason 7 or above. We're not interested in the, the Gleason 6s. We're interested in those patients that have Gleason 7 or above, the high-grade prostate cancer. What's unique about this is it's a non-invasive urine-based assay, and it doesn't require a digital rectal examination. This is what separates it from um, the uh, select test that many of you have probably ordered a urine assay. In that test, you need to do a rectal examination. For the exo uh, test, you don't need to do a rectal examination. And essentially, 
it's it's different from these other markers, you know, PCA3 or select in the sense that you don't need to do a rectal examination. So typically what we do is you'll see there's a special uh, uh, collection container. We uh, obtain 15 milliliters or 15 cc's of urine. We then can extract out the RNA from this and we look at the three markers, the PCA3, the ERG, and the SPDEF, um, do a multivariate analysis, PCR analysis, and then the bottom line is we're able to get a risk stratification that ranges from zero to 100. And so the test scores range from zero to 100. Obviously, the higher the score, the more likelihood of having a high-grade prostate cancer of seven or greater. Now, you can see the cut point that's been used, and we'll talk about the cut point uh, shortly, uh, of 15.6. That's been the cut point. If the cut, if, if, the, uh, epi, uh, if the exo DX test is less than 15.6, then those patients have a lower likelihood of a high-grade prostate cancer, and those patients can go with continued monitoring and may not need a, a biopsy going forward. As you can see, if the cut point is above 15.6, there's a greater likelihood of a high-grade prostate cancer and biopsy may be warranted. So the higher the score, the higher the probability of a high-grade prostate cancer, and, and that's Gleason grade two or greater. And below 15.6, there's a likelihood that the patient doesn't have a high-grade prostate cancer. Now, again, you also may want to take in consideration of you know, age of patients and other things to help with some of this decision making. But you'll see in a second, this cut point has a very high negative predictive value and sensitivity. And I'll show you that in the validation studies uh, in just a moment. Now, one thing about this is uh, the ExoDX is now starting to get broad uh, acceptance. It's been incorporated in the NCCN guidelines in May of last year. Um, it was approved for not only initial biopsies, but prior negative biopsies. So it's not considered experimental at this point in time. There's good Medicare coverage. In December, there, there was a, a positive LCD Medicare coverage. Um, uh, there's Medicaid coverage. And again, many private insurers now have incorporated this um, into their plans. You can see that it actually has been incorporated in the VA system as well. Uh, in these patients um, uh, going uh, forward. And in the state that I'm in, New York, uh, New York has the, uh, a very stringent uh, uh, clinical testing guidelines. It has been approved actually in, in our state, which is probably one of the last states in the union to, to have this test approved. So let's go over some of the, the data that led to this validation that takes place. And and you can see that there were two main studies that were uh, published looking at over a thousand uh, patients. One came out in JAMA uh, Oncology and the other one came out in the European uh, Urology Journal. And essentially, this is uh, studies that were done both from LUGPA and community urologists. And, and it really does give us information about real world practices. The JAMA article appeared in July of 2016. Um, and the European urology was in August of 2018. But essentially, both of these studies mirrored the same and came up with the same result that it demonstrated about a 27% reduction in unnecessary biopsies. And really, what this test discriminates between is the high grade cancers, the Gleason scores seven or higher, from the low grade, the Gleason sixes or below. And it allows improved identification with patients that have higher grade. Um, uh, uh, cancers being present. So this is just the, 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 the validation study. And I really just want you to focus in on uh, the validation cohort, because that's where the, the validation took place. That's where we're going to focus our discussion. You can see that when this trial was originally designed, there was a training cohort, and that really is what was used to develop the signature um, that led to the, the validation of the test. Essentially, the signature is developed first, and then that signature is validated, and it's been validated in, in 519 patients. And this is really sort of an adaptive clinical trial going forward. 
And in the JAMA Oncology, this is uh, the initial study that was done in 2016. These patients were all initial biopsy patients. And essentially, we looked at patients that had PSAs from 2 to 10, that gray zone. So we weren't picking patients with low PSAs or high PSAs to, to artificially inflate the, the results. It really looked at the, the meat of the, the patients that we have concerns about, that 2 to 10 range. The median PSA was 5, and you can see the prostate cancer prevalence um, uh, is 48%. And this test was really scientifically rigorous in its design. And here you can see, looking at patients for initial biopsy, this is the, the, the JAMA validation. You can see the area under the curve was highest in, in the EXO-DX group compared to patients with standard of care, the prostate cancer prevention trial calculator, the European calculator, or just PSA alone. And you can see that across the board, the EXO-DX test outperformed these tests, and it, it you know, you can see the numbers are, are statistically significant across the board here. So if we dive a little bit deeper, looking at the performance of the test in this prospective trial, you can see that 148 patients were found to have uh, 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 um, clinically significant high-grade prostate cancer. And you can see that using the cut points, 12 cases were missed. And of those cases that were missed, um, Nine out of the 12 were Gleason 3 plus 4 with less than three cores positive. You can see that really the bottom line is the negative predictive value was 91.3% and the sensitivity was 92%. And if you ratchet up what the definition of high grade cancer is to being a Gleason 4 plus 3 equals 7 or higher, that negative predictive value increases from 91% up to 97%. And it really identified all patients that had Gleason 6 correctly. So the sensitivity and specificity is quite high. This was this multi-institutional study was developed and validated. And indeed, these numbers are really quite striking going across the board. Now, if we look at the group of patients that had a negative biopsy, here you can see is a cohort of patients that had one prior negative biopsy. 229 patients with a negative biopsy. We utilized the cut point of 15.6. And remember that when this test is obtained, it's the first catch, the non-DRE urine samples. These were from 22 different clinical sites across the country, LUGPA, community urologists, some academic urologists. But you can see that the mean age was 65. The mean PSA was 6.1. There was a 75% family history, and a 14% uh, group of these patients were African American. And when you look at patients that had a prior negative biopsy, again, the negative predictive value was 91.5% when you do the analysis. And here you can see is the, uh, the areas under the curve. You can see with the EXO-DX test, looking at um, the prostate cancer prevention trial calculator, and then just PSA alone, the ExoDX is an independent of clinical factors that the risk calculators or clinical evaluation use. So across the board, and this is from the JAMA paper, really does give us very useful information. Now here you can see is, is trying to look at it in a, in a graphic form. You can see that the teal line represents PSA alone, and you can see that the orange line represents the EXO-DX test done. You can see that the area under the curve is 0.68, and again, you can see that the negative predictive value in the initial biopsy cut point of 15.6 in patients that had one negative prior biopsy, the negative predictive value was 92.4%, and that translated into a 23% biopsy avoidance rate. So by using this test, you can almost a quarter of the patients that you would consider for potential biopsy can be eliminated and not have to undergo a biopsy. Here's another way of just looking at that. You can see the cut point of 15.6. And indeed, by and these are patients that have had a negative prior biopsy. By doing the EXO-DX test, 
you will reduce that uh, biopsy rate by about 23%. So you can see across the board, these are uh, very similar patients across the board, and you can see that you know PSAs will range in these patients across the board, but the bottom line is, is you will be able to save um, uh, uh, essentially 23% of those patients for undergoing a second biopsy. Now, with, in marking and marker studies, like any, whether it's a genomic health marker, whether it's uh, the Polaris marker, um, all of these studies have to undergo a clinical utility study, and the, ex endo, uh, uh, the XODX test is no different. What is different about this is the way this trial was designed. So this is a, 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 um, a, cl a clinical utility study that was done primarily in Chesapeake Urology, 72 urologists, a variety of different clinical sites, and over 1,000 patients. The inclusion criteria that we talked about were those men 50 or higher in age that had a PSA that ranged between 2 and 10. And you can see this was a multi-center clinical uh, utility trial. What was unique about this is that it was blinded to the control arm. And that's what's different about this clinical utility trial. I, I wrote a paper looking at genomic markers with genomic health on uh, uh, a clinical utility trial. I did it with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield up here in, in upstate New York. What was different about our study versus this is you'll see in a second that this was blinded to the control arm. And that's actually unique. It's a prospective, blinded, randomized study uh, with a control arm. And the question that we're really asking is, does it reduce unnecessary biopsies does it increase compliance with the biopsy recommendation? And it does it influence shared decision-making on whether patients should undergo a biopsy. So here's the study design. You can see that 450 patients or so were in two arms. One arm used the ExoDX results for shared decision-making, and then the control arm was blinded. We then looked at um, uh, patients. They all had biopsy results, and these patients have been followed um, you know, for a period of five years. So it was prospective, it was blinded, and it does provide clinical uh, level one evidence going forward. And here really are the key outcomes. Is 72% of patients complied to proceeding with the biopsy recommendation based on doing the test? 92% complied to defer the biopsy based on having the test done. And essentially, the test detected you know, 30% more grade, more high grade prostate cancer than the standard of care alone, which would be using age, family history, and digital rectal examination. So the test actually does change behavior of the physician, and it also increases compliance with patient behavior going forward, at least in a real clinical setting. And, and really, the Chesapeake data really is, to me, very convincing and the way that the trial was designed, it's real, it's real world data. And here you can see, let's compare how the clinical utility trial compared to the two validation studies. And here you go, you can see the curves from the, the, the JAMA paper and the European Urology paper, very similar areas under the curve, 0 0.7, 0 0.71 uh, in the two validation studies. And then when you look at the the um, clinical utility study, which is over on the right-hand portion of the diagram, you can see you get a very similar type of curve existing for the areas under the curve. So they're almost identical. The validation studies and the clinical utility studies really show complete agreement across the board to suggest the performance of the test in, the, in picking out high-grade prostate cancer. So what are some of the milestones? Well, I think that whenever uh, these are included in the NCCN guidelines, that's a, a major milestone. And in May of 2019, this test was approved not only for initial but prior negative biopsy patients. In December of 2019, there was Medicare coverage across the board. And then you can see that uh, Medicaid coverage and this was actually awarded a, a, an award by the VA healthcare system uh, just recently in, in May, in, sorry, in March of, of this year. 
Um, and it was approved in New York State, which has probably the rigorous approval criteria of all the states combined. And it was designated as a breakthrough device designation. This is what the report looks like, and it's pretty easy to go through this with patients. You can see on the left-hand side is the, the cut point is illustrated between the green and the orange. That cut point is 15.6. And then below the graph, not only does it tell you what the score is, but it also gives you an interpretation. And you can see in this particular patient, the, the score was 21.73, so it's above the cutoff for higher risk prostate cancer. And you can see that in a second, I'll show you that this will translate into about a, a, a roughly about a 21% risk of an aggressive prostate cancer being found. Now you'll see in a second that, that it, 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 it follows a, a stepwise increasing pattern going across the board. But what's nice about this is patients can understand it. Obviously, if you have a, 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 a patient that's below the cut point, the chance for a high-grade prostate cancer is extremely low, and you may consider that those patients don't need to get a repeat biopsy going forward. Now, here is the stepwise pattern. This is a, a pooled analysis with over 1,000 patients um, from JAMA Oncology and European Urology. And what strikes me is that when you start to see the, the EPI score going upwards, it really roughly translates into what that percent risk of high-grade cancer, when you get to an EPI score of 50 to 60, you start to see this plateauing off. So if you have an EPI score between zero and 50, it really correlates with the, the, the percent risk of a high-grade prostate cancer being present. So that's one way that you can assimilate and, and discuss these results with the patient. You know, should they have a biopsy? Obviously, if you have a number that's above 15.6, when you start to get to 30, 40, 50, it roughly translates into what that percent risk is up to about 50 or so with the translation. So let's go back to our patients. So here we had three patients, you know, pretty much equal in age, relatively straightforward PSAs. And you can see that in these three patients, the EPI scores are very, very different. Um, you can see in the first patient, he was an African-American patient, had, a, had a, a high PSA, but his EPI score was very low. And when I talk about EPI score, um, that's the same thing as the EXO-DX. The original nomenclature when this test was first developed was EPI. They're now switching it to EXO-DX, and I think we'll see the EXO-DX for the prostate, EXO-DX possibly in the future for kidney, for bladder, and so on and so forth. So you can see that the score was 8.3, which is below the cutoff. That patient actually did have a biopsy, and you can see the biopsy was negative. Contrast that with the two patients to the right, E and F, that had similar PSAs, actually even lower PSAs, and you can see that the score was 33.5 and 33.6. Both of these patients underwent a biopsy. One had Gleason 4 plus 4 equals 8. One patient had Gleason 4 plus 3 equals 7. So I think this is just a, a, a nice illustration to show you the power of this test that indeed it can prevent you, the rectal exams, no family history. Obviously, the African-American patient has a, a much higher risk of prostate cancer, but when you did the, the test, his score was below the cutoff of 15.6 and, and is a low-risk patient, and he could have been prevented in having a, a biopsy that was unnecessary. So here you can see this is um, looking at uh, a, a narrow group of patients, patients between 60 and 70 years old, 1,300 patients. You can see that the PSA was in a much nor, uh, narrower range between four and six. Remember when we talked about the validation studies, those patients were greater than 50 and higher, and the PSA was two to 10. Now we're looking at a subgroup of patients that have a much narrower PSA. And then when you look at this narrowed subgroup of patients, indeed, you see the same thing. The negative predictive value is 91.3. So in the patients that are in the blue, these are, are low-risk patients. 
And those patients wouldn't need to have a biopsy where you start to see the patients in the yellow are a much higher risk. So the negative predictive value, similar to what we saw in the validation studies, holds up in a cohort of patients that are studied. Now, it's important to remember that this is not a validation study. This is pooled data looking at men that are in this age group and have this specific PSA. So, um, but what's important, I think, is the takeaway message here is that the negative predictive value is very similar to what we've seen um, across the board. So indeed, the negative predictive value holds, holds water across the board. So to kind of summarize, and I think that this is uh, a, a couple of things that, that are really important. One, this is a non-DRE urine-based genomic test. It's different from uh, uh, 4K, it's different from um, uh, uh, phi. It's, it's a urine-based genomic test that essentially is indicated in men age 50 and older with a PSA between two and 10. There is strong validation data and clinical utility data that essentially shows the same thing, that these studies that by doing this test, you can predict which patients will have um, a high-grade prostate cancer and which patients won't have a high-grade prostate cancer. You can see that multiple studies demonstrate the prostate uh, uh, biopsy avoidance can be you know, 23 to 30 percent, depending on on which study you look at, and this has been included in the NCCN guidelines. So I have started to use this test in my practice. Um, I think what's interesting is that the patients come in, um, if there's any question that you're, you're thinking about doing a biopsy, um, these patients will come in, they have to do the first urine. If they've left the urine in the office, um, you know, as, as they come in, many of our patients come in, leave a urine specimen, then I go into the room. So there is a slight change in the workflow. Um, the company is working on perhaps a, a, a kit that can be developed and taken uh, with the patient home so they get a first void urine. They pee into a special device that fills up and then overflows. It's kind of a, a unique kind of like funnel-like system, if you will. They collect 15 cc's you put it in a bag and then essentially the bag is is picked up by FedEx and sent and and I think with my crystal ball looking forward we're going to start to hopefully see a, the development of a uh, a home collection device that's not present at the present time these kits are in our offices but um, uh, if you think that you're going to want to do this test you want to make sure that you get that first voided specimen when the patient comes in but I've used the test now. Um, I've, I've had an interest in, in, in prostate biomarkers, you know, dating back a, a number of years, have, have written on this pretty extensively. And I really find that this really offers a little more advanced precision. You know, um, this urine genomic test really is, is, provides us information about these aggressive, clinically significant prostate cancers. And, and that's the, the, the type of patient that I really am trying to identify. There's, um, because I really do wanna prevent biopsies unnecessarily in patients. The cost of this can range anywhere from $0, it's covered under Medicare, some Medicaid, private insurers. The maximum cost will be $800. So most Medicare and Medicaid plans do cover it. There are many private insurers that cover it. And if you do have patients that that don't have the means, there is a uh, physician, uh, a, a, a patient assistance program that exists for this that um, your, your local representatives can discuss with you. And that really works really quite well. We've started to use the test with much more vigor in our clinic. And I'm, I'm actually very impressed at the results that we're seeing and trying to prevent you know, unnecessary biopsies and over-treatment of these you know, low-grade prostate cancers or or whether no prostate cancer is present. So first, um, this is just gives a list of relevant publications. Jim McKiernan, as, as many of you know, at Columbia, the chair of Columbia has uh, published some of the material on this. And I think you're gonna hear about exosomes in the future. These are a treasure trove of, of information that has RNA, DNA, protein 
and we can use this marker to our benefit in prostate cancer. And I think that this test is here to stay. It's a simple test. It's easy to obtain. It's non-invasive for patients. And I think it gives very, very useful information. So why don't I stop here? And um, uh, if people have any questions, I think we've got about uh, you know 20 minutes or so for any questions that people may have. But uh, I've now started to incorporate this in my practice. And uh, I would encourage you to take a good look at this. This is uh, sort of the new kid on the block. You know, we've, we've had a lot of markers come and go and, and they're markers that are very useful. But to me, I think that this marker shows incredible promise on trying to differentiate these patients that have the aggressive, clinically significant prostate cancers. So I'll stop and if there's any questions, um, I guess Carla can can read them or uh, or people uh, can chime in and I'd be happy to answer any questions going forward. Great, thank you, Dr. Abala. Um, we do have a few questions and everyone will remain in listen-only mode. Um, just a reminder, if you have a question, please enter it into the question or chat box and I'll um, ask the, the questions directly with Dr. Abala. So, the first one is, and I'll wordsmith it a little bit, um, but it's around compliance um, toward the epi test that you've seen in your practice. Have you have you seen um, greater compliance to defer or or proceed to biopsy as was demonstrated in the clinical utility study? The, the answer is yes. And again, our experience is increasing with this. But I think what this test does is is provides you know, many of the clinical utility trials for like the genomic markers in prostate cancer did change physician behavior. But what I think is unique about, about this clinical utility trial is that it was blinded and it did change patient behavior. And we, you saw the numbers of increased compliance with the patients, either to have a biopsy or to defer the biopsy. This essentially made them feel better. And it's, I, I think that, that, the clinical utility trial really speaks for itself because it's real world data. It's, 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 it's been gathered by, you know, you know, primarily LUGPA and community urologists to show the power of this test. So uh, we're starting to use this test more and more in our offices. It's, it's, uh, what I found is it's very easy to explain the results to the patient. And I actually like to get the results back I try to mail a copy. I'll show the patient before they leave the visit what the results potentially can look like, show them what the report looks like. I have a, a laminated you know, uh, report that shows what a, a, you know, a score is. And I say to the patient, the cutoff is 15.6. You can either be to the left, which is the, the more favorable range, or you can be to the right, which is the more unfavorable range. And, and they seem to get it. And, you know, there's the interpretation, and obviously, you want to take some clinical data. You know, uh, uh, you want to, you know, put this in with the patient age, the family history. You know, and we can do that. Now, it's it's very interesting. You know, we're we're in trying times right at the moment. Um, you know, patients, uh, our, our our office visit numbers have dropped dramatically. Hopefully, this is a a temporary thing with the coronavirus, and so. You know, do we want to bring patients in? Obviously, you know, in this day and age, if a 50-year-old man comes in with a, with a, a you know, a, a high uh, uh, exo-DX score, um, you, you know, that patient, I'm going to probably be more aggressive and, and, but we're starting to see a ramp down of, of biopsies because, you know, whether those are necessary or unnecessary in this climate is a, a hard decision to, to make. And, you know, there's, that's not been looked at, at at the company. I don't think any one of us envisioned how we're practicing today a year ago. I think this has kind of crept up on us. It's having an impact. I can tell you some of my colleagues in, at academic institutions in New York City, their offices are closing and the universities are, are calling them into the emergency room to be triage doctors for the coronavirus. So, um, you know, you have to make that decision in this climate, but in a in a perfect world, and I hope that comes in the next, you know, two to three months, you know, this score 
does differentiate which patients I'm going to recommend a biopsy. And I do, I do think that it improves compliance both with the patient and the physician. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, another question here is, is the EPI score algorithm independent of standard of care parameters? The answer to that is yes. The EPI score is different. It doesn't include standard of care parameters. It, it looks at three biomarkers, ERG, PCA3, and SPDEF. It looks at those. It does not um, uh, use the standard of care. And obviously, when you get the result, then you can you know, factor in those standard of care features, age, family history, and so on. But it is independent of standard of care features. Great, thank you. And you talked a little bit about uh, reviewing epi results with patients. Are, there's two questions I'm going to combine. Uh, do they understand the score? What, what kinds of questions do, do they ask about it? Well, you know, um, typically they, I, I think most patients really want to know whether they should have a biopsy and, and how confident am I? And, and I'll say that there's two validation studies. There's a clinical utility study. And what's unique is that the results from all three of those studies, independent studies, essentially showed the same thing on the negative predictive value. So if you have a high score, there's a, a high likelihood that you potentially could have a, an aggressive uh, high-risk prostate cancer existing, greater at least in score seven or greater in, in that particular patient. So they ask about that. They, they talk about, you know, is there a blood test? So some questions that I've gotten have been, you know, are there other tests that look at this? And the answer is yes. You know, um, they, you know, we, I tell them, you know, in, in the old days, we just had PSA and then we factored in these other standard of care features. And then, you know, with the 4K score, um, you know, these, these tests are good, but they're different. And I think that, you know, the 4K and, and um, um, the, the PHI, the Prostate Health Index, do incorporate standard of care features. The, the prostate calculators, the prostate cancer prevention, and the European calculator do factor in certain standard of care features. This test is independent. You know, I think all of these tests are useful. So, you know, I, I'm not here to say, you know, one test is better than the other. I'm just telling you that, you know, I've used all the tests and I really like this test. It's simple to do. It gives me very useful clinical information and patients can understand it. And it's a reasonably priced test. So all of those features to me are important. You know, this test has been, been used in over 26,000 patients around the country. You know, it's been validated in over a thousand patients as you saw you know, it's independent of PSA and standard of care features. And, you know, I don't have to do a digital rectal exam. You know, I always wondered when I did PCA3, am I massaging the prostate properly or even with select, which I think is a good test, but, you know, am I massaging the prostate correctly? And, and I think exosomes are this new branch of science that really are a treasure trove of information. And I think now we're starting to harness the power of this, this, this uh, uh, test to help us make treatment decisions in patients. And I think it's an exciting future that lies ahead for, for exosomes. Great, thank you. And uh, not seeing, I have one more question for you, if it's okay. Yeah. Um, how would you, would you use this test with or without MRI? And I think that's a great question. And, um, you know, I think going forward that you can use this test in conjunction with MRI. And when you use it in conjunction with MRI, it really does increase the sensitivity of picking up the high-grade cancers. You know, the value of MRI is to identify a, a, a lesion that we can specifically target. I mean, the real benefit of MRI fusion biopsies is that instead of doing random biopsies, we can actually target a specific area within the prostate. And when you combine this with MRI, um, and that has been done, 
looking at that, you know, the clinical value increases dramatically. So I have now really do feel that these tests can be used in conjunction with one another uh, to try to really pick those patients that are going to have this, this higher risk, more aggressive type of prostate cancer. So I, I would tell you that, that going forward, um, I think we're going to see the combination of MRI and the ExoDX test being used more commonly together than being done separately. So um, we've had some issues with insurance companies paying for the initial biopsy with MRI. They're getting better. Um, but I can tell you, you know, six months ago, I was on the phone almost all the time trying to get an MRI fusion biopsy. And, and a lot of time I'd be denied on the initial biopsy. It seems that on the second biopsy, um, you know, if the PSA was rising, the insurance companies back down and it was approved 100% in those patients. I don't think we're quite at the point where all MRIs are going to be approved by insurance companies yet. And I think that, that this test can be used in combination with that to get us more information. Okay, I don't see any more questions. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Abala, and thanks everyone for joining. This will be the end of the program.